That is the prayer of our heart that the Lord would grant us a closer walk with Him. That is the testimony of the Apostle Paul when he says that I determined to know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings. Paul said he was willing to abandon all to know Jesus even closer. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, let's turn to the book of Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. It's right after Ephesians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. So it's in those letters. The book of Philippians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a church in Philippi as he was in a house arrest. He was arrested, actually. And he actually says in chapter 1, whether I am set free or whether I go on to be with the Lord, I lose my life for the sake of Christ. He says it does not matter. And that theme is carried all the way through to the end of chapter 4, as we'll see this morning. But we're taking a break from a sermon series as we look at just a few different um, topics. Of course, coming from Scripture last week, we looked at Jesus' statement about little children coming to me. He says, suffer the little children not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And then today we're going to turn our attention to the topic of money, possessions, and generosity. We're doing all this before we begin our new sermon series in the book of 1 Samuel in just a couple weeks. It'll actually probably be the second week in February that we begin that. So it'll be a long study. It's going to be a good study. And uh, you be praying for me as I prepare for that. And you be preparing by reading through 1 Samuel. Today we find ourselves in Philippians chapter 4 as we think about a Christian perspective of money, possessions, and generosity. So pick up in verse 10 of chapter 4 and we'll read through verse 20. The word of the Lord says, and of course I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that once again you renewed your care for me. Some translations say you revived your care for me. You were, in fact, concerned about me, but lacked the opportunity to show it. I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know both how to have a little, and I know how to have a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. And here's the famous verse, often ripped out of context, but here we find it in its context. Paul says, I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Still, you did well by sharing with me in my hardships. And you Philippians know that in the early days of the gospel when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even in Thessalonica you sent gifts for my need several times. Not that I seek the gift, but I do seek the profit that is increasing to your account. Or the benefit, some translations say, that is to your account. Verse 18, but I have received everything in full and I have an abundance. I am fully supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have provided, a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus, or riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we turn our attention to what your word says about gifts, generosity, about money, possessions, we ask that you would teach us. For what we read about in these verses goes against much of what we have caught from the world, what we have picked up from our society. So we pray that you would challenge our faulty thinking. We pray that you would encourage us from your word. We ask that you would lead us to focus our attention on you, Lord Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Giving is not easy. 
Giving is not easy whether you are the one doing the giving, you are the giver, or sometimes you are the receiver. You're the one receiving that gift, and that is because it can be awkward to receive at times. It can be humble, humiliating, um, and also on the giving side, it can be sacrificial giving and cause some turmoil within you, but giving is not easy. And that is because when you're giving, you're dealing with finances or possessions. And when we think about possessions or finances that can be a touchy subject even in the context of a church it should not be in the context of a church but often when you when you talk about finances from the church or from the pulpit's perspective it can be a little bit awkward because money or the abundance of it or the lack of it should not influence our heart, but it is influenced by our heart. It's a complex issue because it's so interwoven with our heart. It's not something abstract that is something out there in the world, but we cannot escape the reality that every single one of us must have a perspective about money, whether you don't like it, whether you like it, whether you see it as a tool or you see it as a curse. We all have a view about money and the apostle paul is addressing that view to the christians at philippi as he thanks them for the gift that he receives from them now i've already mentioned as he says in chapter one that he is in he's under arrest for being a christian being a missionary being one who shares the gospel and the christians at philippi are concerned about him he says earlier that they've always been concerned about him so they're wanting to send him a gift now they take this gift they package it up they send it with a man named epaphroditus who he mentions in this passage now we learn if we were to read the the whole book we would learn that Epaphroditus was someone who ministered to the Apostle Paul so much that he almost be he almost died he became sick as the Apostle Paul says almost unto death and so the Christians are sending someone very dear to them very special to them someone whom they treasure and highly value from the congregation to minister to the Apostle Paul with this financial gift and Paul, after, after Epaphroditus kind of comes out of his sickness, Paul sends Epaphroditus back to the Christians at Philippi with this letter. And as he closes this letter with his own greeting, with his own hand, he is thanking them for the gift that they gave to him. And what he's doing is trying to teach them God's view of money, possessions, and generosity. Now, many of us have learned unbiblical attitudes concerning money or possessions or, or um, generosity because the world has taught us things. We've caught things from the world. We've learned things from society around us, whether it's from our parents, our grandparents, or from the business world. We're all, we've all picked up wrong attitudes toward money and possessions. And we should allow the Bible to correct us, to challenge us in any area where we're wrong, but especially so regarding money. Now, I must confess that as a pastor, I'm very hesitant about addressing this subject for several reasons because I believe many people speak, speak wrongly from it, uh, uh, speak wrongly about it from the pulpit. And so I want to be very, very careful as I approach this topic. But I acknowledge that the Bible is not silent on this. 15% of the words of Jesus in the Gospels address money and possessions. Do you realize that that's more than what he said concerning heaven and hell combined? Jesus spoke more about money and possessions than he did about heaven and hell combined. Now, I think we'll see the reason as we work through this text, the reason why he did that. But also, Lay Perget, per, 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 Ket, who is a financial guru, says that there are at least 700 verses in the Bible that speak about money. So we need to ask ourselves, why do we dodge this topic? so much is it because we're afraid that god will ask us to give all of our money away and this attitude reveals what we think about god if we really believe that god is good that he loves us and that he wants what is best for us then why do we not trust him why do we not listen to what his word says about money I believe that if we investigate what Jesus says all throughout Scripture, but if we narrow our attention this morning, specifically on this passage, verses 10 through 20, then we'll find this topic very liberating for us. Not constricting, 
Not oppressive, but we'll find it very liberating. Now, there is no way that I can address everything that the Bible says about money this morning. That's one reason we're having this class on Wednesday evenings, Financial Peace University. Because this is a little more of the nuts and bolts of how to handle your money. So once again, I want to make a plug for you. If you're, you're not coming or not signed up for that, please mark your calendars for that and show up. Because we're going to be discussing the, the, the nuts and bolts and the details of managing money. But this morning, what I kind of want to do is lay this foundation or this theory on how Christians should view money and finances and possessions. So first of all, notice from the text that Christians should have a generous perspective of money. Christians should have a generous perspective of money. Look at verse 10. Paul says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that once again you renewed or you revived your care for me. You were in fact concerned about me but lacked the opportunity to show it. What Paul is highlighting in this verse is the desire of the Christians at Philippi to minister to him. Even when they did not have the resources, Paul said, you wanted to give to me. You wanted to minister to me. And what he's displaying here is that all Christians should be generous. They should be quick to give because generosity reflects your heart, not the quantity of your possessions. Generosity reflects your heart, not the quantity of your possessions. Have you ever heard anyone say, or maybe you thought this, if I just had this much money, if I had this much in my bank account, then I would give to this cause or that cause. If I just had this much, then I would give. But the reality is that that if you are not generous in what you have right now, you will not be generous when you have more. If you're not generous with what you have right now, you will not be generous when you have more. If you are not tithing right now, you will not tithe if you had a million dollars in the bank. If you are not generous, these Christians at Philippi desired so much to give to the Apostle Paul that they found a way. Where there is a desire, you will find a way to give to the Lord. The Christians at Philippi wanted to give even when they didn't have the resources, but their desire eventually found a way for them to give. And if you truly want to give, your desire will motivate you to give. A heart transformed by the gospel is a generous heart. Think about what the gospel says in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave. Our Lord is the greatest giver. He has displayed his generous spirit to us in the giving of his son. He did not hold back anything from us, but gave himself for us to redeem us. And out of that truth, we give back to him. Not to be blessed, but because we've been so richly blessed in Christ. If you are not generous, then you do not understand the gospel. Your heart may not be transformed by the gospel. Because once you realize what you've been given in Jesus, you want to give. Think about some of the examples that we read in the New Testament. Zacchaeus, one of the most famous ones. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. The Lord said, Zacchaeus, come down for I'm coming to your house today. Do you realize what happens in that story? After Zacchaeus encounters Jesus... And salvation comes to Zacchaeus' heart. His heart is transformed. What does Zacchaeus do? He says, I am determined to give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have wronged anyone, I'm going to repay them four times as much. See, a heart transformed by the gospel is generous. In con- contrast that with another story that we read in the gospels where Jesus comes face to face with the rich young ruler The scripture says, after Jesus tells the rich young ruler, if you want to inherit eternal life, then you must give away everything to the poor. Now, giving away everything to the poor would not earn that rich young ruler salvation, but Jesus knew that that rich young ruler had an idol in the throne of his heart, and that idol was his money and possessions. And for him to come to Jesus, he had to give it all away. But the scripture says that man went away sad and grieved. Why? Because he had a lot of possessions. 
So we see contrasted in Scripture, one who is truly transformed, where salvation comes within their heart. They're generous, but one who is not transformed by the gospel holds on to their possessions. A heart that cares wants to help others. I like what Andrew Carnegie says. We've been reading about him in our house this week, and regardless of what you think about his theology, I don't agree with all of his theological views, but Andrew Carnegie, one of the wealthiest men that our country has ever produced, gave almost all of his possessions away for the betterment of those around him. And he said to his fellow wealthy people, those other businessmen who were wealthy, the man who dies rich dies disgraced. Now, he's not, he wasn't against wealth. He was a very wealthy man himself. But what he was saying is that you've been entrusted with this wealth in order to help others. And if you're just holding on to it and becoming wealthy just for the sake of being wealthy, then you've missed the big picture. Your wealth is intended to minister and help others. A heart that cares wants to help others. That's what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 21. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you put all of your treasure in the bank account, then that's where your heart will be. If you put all of your treasure in this world, in this life, for the here and now, that's where your heart will be. So if we store up treasures for ourselves in heaven, that's where our heart will be. Since we love people, we want to take care of them. We want to minister to them. We care about the lost people in China, so we send money to support missionaries in China. We care about that little village in Hawaka, southern Mexico, who does not have the Bible in their language. So we support the Davis family, who's going to live there, learn their language, put a written alphabet on paper, translate the New Testament into their language so that they can read the Bible for themselves. We care them so much that we're sending money there. We care about the lost people in Latin America, so we support the Lang family as well. We care about children in Youngsville, so we do backpack buddies, and we make sure that they have food on their table. And if we truly care about people, then we will spend money, time, resources, and possessions to meet their needs. Now, money is not always the solution to their problem, but sometimes it is. And sometimes it takes money to get the solution to where they are. So Christians should have a generous attitude or perspective toward money because we've been given so much, we want to give. But secondly, The second perspective, Christians should have a contented perspective toward money and possessions. Look at verses 11 through 13. I don't say this out of need. This is the Apostle Paul. For I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know both how to have a little and I both know how to have a lot. In any and all circumstances I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Contentment does not mean that you don't care about your financial position. Contentment does not mean that you do not want to better yourself because sometimes laziness or apathy is disguised as contentment. But that's not what Paul's saying here. He's basically saying whether I was in need or whether I had an abundance, I was content in Christ. God has placed you where you are for a moment and the attitude that you have toward him reflects whether you're you're contented or not. A 16th century Puritan named Jeremiah Burroughs wrote an entire book on this verse and he says, and I quote, Christian contentment is the sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. So wherever God God has you, whether you're rich or poor, you're content in Him. Now, that doesn't mean you do not want to better yourselves. For instance, um, you've heard the phrase, bloom where you are planted. Now, that is true. You do need to bloom where you are planted, but also realize that the great gardener, God Himself, can dig you up and put you somewhere else. Maybe He knows that during this season of your life, you need a little shade. 
But in another season of your life, you need a lot more sunshine. So he digs you up and puts you somewhere else. And that contentment is reflected that you trust him. That you trust him. And this is a hard lesson to learn, as the Apostle Paul says in this passage. Look at verse 12. It has to be learned because it does not come natural. Paul says, I've learned the secret. There is this mystery. There is a secret to being content. It does not come naturally for us because it's hard to be poor. If, you're, if you've ever suffered from poverty, you know that feeling that it will breed resentment at times. You are resented, toward, you have a resentment toward others who are wealthier than you are. So you, you, it breeds resentment. It also brings despair. You don't have any hope. It also brings greed. Some of the most greedy people that we've all experienced sometimes suffer from poverty. You don't have to be rich to be greedy. Also, it's hard to be rich. It also bring, breeds resentment. You're, you have resentment toward those who are just as wealthy as you are but did not work as hard as you did. It also breeds despair, like Solomon who wrote Ecclesiastes. If you ever want to read from the pen of somebody who was rich but yet suffered from despair, read the book of Ecclesiastes. Basically, Solomon says, it does not bring what I was searching for, but it also breeds greed as well. You are always fighting the idea, whether you're poor or rich, Every single person will fight this idea. If I just had this, fill in the blank, then I would be happy. If I just had this, fill in the blank, then I would be satisfied. If I just had this, fill in the blank, then everything would be okay. This is the idea that fuels the lottery. Now, I do want to take just a side note here, kind of a rabbit trail, a parenthesis from this text and talk about something that is very applicable to our society. Now, it's not arising straight from the text, although I think it is connected to the text. I do want to mention something in regard to the lottery because I am amazed at how many Christians see nothing wrong with playing the lottery or for gambling in any way. But see, this is that mentality that fuels the lottery. Why do people buy a lottery ticket. They buy a lottery ticket because they think money will solve their problems. They think they view their problem as this, that, or this. If I could just have more money, then everything would be okay. But the amount of money that you have is not your problem. It's the managing of money that is your problem. If you cannot manage $100, what makes you think you can manage a million dollars? It's not the amount of money that is your problem. It's managing money. If you're ever tempted to buy a lottery ticket, maybe you should write down these three things I'm getting ready to say. I just wrote down three things off the top of my head that comes to mind when I think about people playing the lottery. And I see them. I can get behind them down here at the convenience store. And I joke with them all the time. I say, you'll probably get more satisfaction if you'll go buy you a Coke with that money instead. And just I'm just play I just play with them a little bit, mess with them. I say, How much money have you won? Oh, I've won fifty dollars. I'm like, How much have you spent? Oh, I've spent a lot of money. So uh but no, three things I just thought of. Wealthy people do not get their wealth by playing the lottery. Wealthy people do not get their wealth by pay, playing the lottery. They worked for it. Anyone who has wealth for an extended amount of time worked hard for their money. Now, that, this is the same principle of why children who have been given a large sum of money often blow it. Because they didn't work for it. And if someone were just to hand you money, you would probably blow it, not use it wisely. Wealthy people, study after study after study, displays that people who have an extended amount of money earned their money. It was not given to them. Secondly, they have it figured out. Guess what? If you were to win something in the lottery, you're not the winner. The lottery system is the winner. They're not giving away money out of the goodness of their heart. They're making a profit, just like every casino. They have it figured out. And it is a tax on the poor. I like what I think Dave Ramsey has said this. I've heard others say this. Lottery is played by people who don't do math. <laughs> and that is the case. They simply don't do math. Third thing, people who win the lottery blow it. Every, 
Every single person who's won a big in the lottery blows every single cent of it. A couple years ago, I sat down and watched a two-hour documentary, I think it was on NBC, about uh, the lottery winners. And every single one of those winners had lost everything and went bankrupt in under two years. Every single cent. Because, you see, it wasn't the amount of money that was their problem. It was the managing of money that was their problem. And and what that reveals, and the reason this is connected, kind of tucked in, this application is tucked in um, under this verse, is because the, the motivation to buy a lottery ticket is that you are not content in where the Lord has you. You do not trust Jesus. You do not trust this word that instructs us how to build wealth. And that is to work for it, to trust him, to be content in him. While our perspective of money is a spiritual issue, the amount we have is not. Now, this is very, very important. Look at verse 12. I know both to have a a little, and I both know how to have a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. We have a tendency to view those, if we're wealthy, to view those who are poor, as less spiritual than us. We have a tendency, if we're poor, to view those who are wealthy as less spiritual than us. But there is nowhere in Scripture that says if you have a lot of money, then you are less spiritual, you are less holy. It's not the amount of money you have. It's your attitude toward it. Think about all of the rich people in Scripture. You have everyone from Abraham. Abraham was a man who had immense wealth. He's the father of Israel. You had others. You had, um, you had Joseph of Arimathea who, who gave the tomb to Jesus to be buried. You had Job who was very, very wealthy. And then on the other side, you had the, the widow who gave everything, the widow's might. You have Jesus who himself did not have somewhere to lay his head. So let us not look down on those who have money and let us not look down on those who do not have money. We're all trying to learn a valuable lesson together. And what is that lesson? Verse 13, we see, and this is often ripped out of context, the secret of being content is I am able to do all things. Now, this is not when you're stepping up to the plate to to hit a home run or you're getting ready to seal that business deal. You don't quote this. You know, a lot of times we say, well, I can do this. through. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is not the context of that verse. The context of this verse is I can be poor or rich. I'm content in Christ because he is the secret. Paul does not allow his wealth or lack thereof as an excuse for not completing the mission which God has given him. Jesus is enough for Paul. So Unity Baptist Church, we can never use our size, our position, our status, our bank account to ever dictate what we do for King Jesus. We can never say, oh, we're just a small country church. We can never say, well, we're living in a good neighborhood. We never use our poverty or our wealth as an excuse for not completing the mission of God. But we complete the mission which he has given us. Do we view Jesus as enough for us as the Apostle Paul? Do you view Jesus as the one who gives you possessions? Or do you view your possessions as a tool to teach you more about Jesus? A good way to do a little checkup is to think about your prayers. What are your prayers? Do your prayers consist in, Lord, give me this, give me that? Lord, I need this, Lord, I need that. There's nothing wrong with asking the Lord for things. He tells us to come to Him with our request. That should not be the sum of our prayer. Children of Israel are going through the wilderness, and what does the Lord tell them in Deuteronomy chapter 8? You recall? The Lord says, I led you these 40 years and humbled you so that you would know that man does not live by bread alone. Listen to that again. He says, I led you and I fed you these past 40 years so that you would know that man does not live by bread alone. The Lord said it's more important that you have knowledge in your mind of who I am than for your belly to be full. It's more important for you to have this knowledge of who Jesus is than for you 
to be satisfied and happy this side of eternity. Ask yourselves, why do you want more money if you want more money? There's nothing wrong with wanting more, but if it's that you think that it will bring you pleasure or stability that Jesus can bring, then you've made that money an idol. We should be wise and we should buy insurance and we should prepare for things because God often uses those things to take care of us. There's nothing wrong with those things, but let us realize that we're just as stable if we don't have them as if we do have them. Kim sang it earlier in the service. His eye is on the sparrow. And if his eye is on the sparrow, you know he watches over us. Thirdly, and we'll kind of try to land the plane this morning. I've got many, many notes and I'm trying to blaze through them. But thirdly, Christians should have an eternal perspective of money and possessions. So let's have a contented perspective of money and possessions. Let's have a generous perspective, but also let's have a eternal perspective of money and possessions. We work our whole lives planning for retirement, but many of us forget about the next phase of life after retirement. And yes, there is a phase after retirement. It's the next life. It's once we die and we either go to heaven or hell. It's true retirement, true rest when this life is over. Are you working on that investment? Are you only putting money in your 401k or are you putting up treasures for yourself in heaven? Look at verses 15 through 20 as we try to draw everything together. And you Philippians know that in the early days of the gospel when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even in Thessalonica you sent gifts gifts for me several times, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit or the interest that is increasing to your account. But I have received everything in full and I have abundance. Paul says, you know, I'm thankful for the gift, but I'm really grateful that you're putting up treasures for yourself in heaven. This is actually benefiting your account. This investment can be never taken away. You know, we, there, we save money and we should save money. We should prepare, but something could happen and we could lose all of our financial resources. We could lose everything we possessed. But anything we spent on seeing boys and girls come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior cannot be taken away by an economic depression or by a government or by sickness The money you give for missions and seeing people come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior can never be taken away from you. That's treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves cannot break in and steal. But look at verse 18. So not only is this an investment as we have an internal perspective, but it's an act of worship. This is not just giving to Unity Baptist Church. It's not giving to the leaders of Unity Baptist Church. It's not just giving to this this charity or that charity or to the IMB or to the North American Mission Board. But it's giving, as he says in verse 18 and 19 to the Lord himself. This is a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. So when you give, you're giving to God. That's why we have an offering in the worship service. This is why I'm not huge on other forms of giving outside of the worship service, that we should literally be passing the plate or having you come up and put money in the plate as an act of worship. Because during that time, as Kim sang earlier, this was a time of worship. The offering is a time of worship because you're giving to God. We give as a response to him. What he so freely given to us, but also we give sacrificially. Look at what he says. It's a, a, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Now, I, I very, I've always hesitated about talking about our financial giving, but I do so as an example to demonstrate to you my, my commitment to it. My family is always committed to giving a tithe. We teach our children, you get something for your birthday, you're giving 10% to King Jesus. But in the New Testament, listen very carefully, in the Old Testament there is a tithe. There are actually many tithes in the Old Testament. As you get to the New Testament, there's no longer a tithe. You don't see the word tithe in the New Testament. You know why? 
Because it should not be something legalistic. It shouldn't be something that's a, that you have to give. You should want to give to the Lord. If your heart is transformed by the Lord, you should want to give to Him. So for an advice, I always tell people, you need to give 10%. And we're committed to always give 10% to our local church. But we also strive to give more than that, not only to our church, but to other offerings and other charities and other places as well. And in our family, we call that an offering. You can call it whatever you want in your family. But we talk, call it our tithe, and then we call it our offering. And we believe that you should be giving over and above 10%. And if you're not, ask yourselves why. why um, ask yourselves why you don't want to. Are you not trusting the Lord? Now, this is not in Scripture. This is from personal testimony. Time after time after time after time after time, there has been circumstances in the li- in my, Kelly in my life where we tithed, and by the end of the week or the end of the day, the Lord had already given more back to us more than what we had given to Him. Now, that's not a promise. I can't say the Lord is always going to do that because that may not be in your best interest. But he does do that. If his eye is on the sparrow, he watches over you. Do you not trust him? I like what A.W. Tozer says. What we need badly these days is a company of Christians who are prepared to trust God as completely now as they trust him on the last day. If you trust Jesus to get you into heaven, why don't you trust him with your pocketbook? Just some questions to ask. Money, possessions, and generosity is a complex topic because it's so woven within our hearts. It's complex because the problem is never the amount, but it's always the perspective that you have of money. It's complex because we are taught so many wrong views in our society that it's hard to tell between truth and error. And But we should be thankful that even though it is complex, God has not left this topic 